on behalf of the History Society of NY Galway and the Irish Centre for Human Rights, I'm delighted to welcome you here to this year's uh, Holocaust Memorial event. Uh, some years ago, uh, Tommy came for the first time uh, to us, invited by the Centre, and um, we were so impressed by his contribution and the importance of Holocaust remembrance that we made a pledge to continue having an event every year to commemorate the, the, the Holocaust and the events <laughs> that dark period in, in, in European history. Um, reading a piece by uh, Rivka Weinberg, an, an American um, uh, philosopher, uh, speaking about the road to Auschwitz. Uh, she said that the road to Auschwitz was built by hate, uh, and not just by indifference. It was paved with collaboration. Anti-Semitism was entrenched in Europe for centuries before the Holocaust, supplying the Nazis with their collaborators. During the Holocaust, the local population, the police, the army often helped the Nazis. Not always, of course, there were those who, who were resistors and heroes in many ways, and then many people like you and me, who perhaps were bystanders. But one thing is clear, during the Holocaust, where the local population was more anti-Semitic, they tended towards greater collaboration, and the consequences for the Jewish population were much more serious. I, 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 I highlight this because all of the evidence points to growing anti-Semitism throughout Europe. All the independent monitors, and most especially the European Union's Fundamental Rights Agency, have been tracking this for some years. And it is a major issue. And it is an issue that this week was highlighted by all the Holocaust survivors that I've uh, read about from Auschwitz and elsewhere. So, but it's worth remembering that to kill people living within a population, you have to be told who and where they are. You don't just march into Poland or France or Hungary and magically know where to round up where, where the Jews live. It's even more helpful when the local police do, do the rounding up for you, as they did in Lithuania, as they did in France and Hungary. So the correlation between local enthusiasm and genocide and murder and, and murder rate of the Holocaust is strong and stark. In countries like Romania and Ukraine, that were virulently anti-Semitic, prior to the war, the consequences were absolutely astonishing for the Jewish population, and few survived. In other countries like Italy and Bulgaria, where the culture of anti-Semitism was not so strong, the consequences were less. The consequences were still serious. So the truth about how massive moral crimes occurs is, is unsettling. It's unsettling to accept how many people participated in the appalling moral crimes and what it, what it is and how we can prevent such things in the future. Rivka speaks about the need to guard against hate and the need not to be collaborators by our indifference and by our apathy. Few people will be willing stand bystanders unless prior to witnessing an event they have been fed hatred, suspicion, and other elements of the dark side of human emotions. We don't expect everybody to be a hero. And in fact, um, Rivka Weinberger's mother was saved during the Holocaust by a Japanese consul in Lithuania, who single-handedly was responsible for issuing visas to thousands of Jews prior to the arrival of the Gestapo. Not everybody will be in such a position. But today, there is growing anti-Semitism. There is growing fear, distrust. There is growth in a negative form of nationalism and xenophobia, all of which perpetuate the type of environment which facilitates uh, something like the Holocaust. There's been some controversy, and this is where what makes history quite important, and it's appropriate that it should be the History Society with the Human Rights uh, Center that should be hosting this. But both Poland and Lithuania are currently seeking to rewrite some of the historical narrative of the war. Comparing the calamity of the Jews in the Holocaust to that of the Poles in World War II only underscores how unequal the persecution was. Not because Jewish blood is worth less or more than Polish blood. Murder is murder, whether the victim is Jewish 
are Polish or from any other group. The difference stems from the different ideological motives that led to the acts of murder and to the way they were committed. Entire community, the Jewish population in Poland and elsewhere, in contrast to the Polish people, was condemned to total and absolute annihilation. In the words of Eli Wiesel, not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were victims. The distinguishing feature of the Holocaust is that the six million Jews that had died were singled out for their total destruction and extermination. It is not to diminish the persecution that was suffered by others. And Tommy, in his book, uh, rightly points out that he shared Bergen Belsen with, of course, the majority were Jewish, but there were Jehovah's Witnesses. There were the gay and lesbian community, or what we would call the LGBT community of today. There were political dissidents. There were Roma and Sinti. They were all targeted for persecution, but none were targeted for their absolute and total destruction. This is the chief characteristic of, of the Shoah. And this is why we need to remember it, to ensure it does not ever occur again. Hitler was reputed to have said, when challenged about the legality of the final solution, that whoever heard of the extermination of the Armenians? Sadly, and I speak as a lawyer, almost everything that the Third Reich did and the, Nazi, the Nazis perpetrated against the Jews and others was legal because they framed it within their legislative uh, setup to make it so, to facilitate it so. But the question is, and it's a question for us to be mindful of, is what created, what allowed such an environment to emerge? And uh, reading during the week the thoughts of some of the Holocaust survivors, um, and with regard to the 75th liberation of uh, celebrating the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the motto was, we have a dark premonition because we know. Many of the survivors, the few that are left, are very fearful of the dark clouds that are gathering around the world, but especially in Europe. And they are fearful for their grandchildren, that they would have to endure what they endured. And they're fearful for the world that is being created. And they want to challenge us so that we do not listen to the voices of hatred, that we challenge the voices that seek to sow distrust between human beings, whether that's based on ethnicity, race, religion, color, or whatever. These are artificial distinctions. These need to be challenged at the early stages. As Tommy pointed out the last time when he spoke here, the genocide ended in the concentration camps, but it began a long time before that. The word that Tommy used was, it began with the whispers. So I'd ask you to consider the extent of what the Holocaust meant. Six million, it's an easy number to rattle off. But just for a moment, I'd ask you to ponder that arbitrarily, those most loved and precious to you in your lives are taken from you. You never see them again. Tommy did not learn until after the release from Bergen Belsen that 35 of his immediate family died during the Holocaust. And that unfortunately would reflect the experience of so many Jews during the war. So we have a responsibility, and the Holocaust survivors tell us this. It's not just to have tears and for the memory of those that died. To truly honor and respect their memory, we must ensure that it doesn't happen again. And we must be mindful, and I'm taking, these, I'm taking this from the words of the survivors, to protect all minorities, to protect all vulnerable groups. Of course they're concerned about their Jewish descendants, but they're also concerned about all similar groups. So it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Tommy Reichenthal, and welcome him back again to NUI Galway uh, to talk about his experience. And uh, uh, Tommy needs no introduction. He most recently received the Bar Council's Human Rights Award. He has written extensively and advocated extensively on the Holocaust. In his own words, for decades he remained silent, and then he began to speak. And ever since, and I quote Tommy, 
they can't stop me talking about it. <laughs> but it is such a rare opportunity to meet somebody with such, um, such humanity and such ability to forgive and with uh, a great sense of the rights and wrongs of the world. I was so impressed the last time you were here, Tommy, when you challenged the audience to remember that you were once a refugee. And when we're looking at what's happening in, in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, to remember those people fleeing persecution, looking for uh, a place of safety to come to, that we remember Tommy. And we remember that we did not have, and I speak here to the Irish audience, we did not have a record to be proud of during the Second World War, or in the aftermath of the Second World War. In fact, we should hang our heads in deep shame. Um, I'm delighted also to welcome Ben Barker, who agreed to come uh, from the United Kingdom, who is a renowned Holocaust scholar and um, uh, has taken time out of his busy schedule. He's recently retired from London's uh, Wiener Library, um, where he was director. Uh, it's the world's, world's oldest institute created for the documentation of the Holocaust, where he worked for 32 years. Um, today, he is chair of the Academic Advisory Board of the UK's Holocaust Memorial Foundation, which is creating Britain's National Holocaust Memorial next to the Houses of Parliament. He is also an advisory board on the advisory board of the Imperial War Museum's brand new Holocaust Memorial Exhibition. And he is, as a Holocaust scholar, he has written extensively. So, I'm now going to explain that uh, Ben will have a series of questions which he will put to Tommy, and there will be a discussion, free flowing discussion. At the end, then, we will have a question and answer stage. I want to apologize on behalf of um, uh, the Deputy President, uh, Paul O'Doherty, who actually was supposed to chair this evening's event. In his absence, I'm going to do so. So um, I'm now going to hand the floor over to Ben and to Tommy. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for, for the invitation. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, I think for many people, they have the impression that most, if not all, that there is to be known about the Holocaust is now established. And the reality is really very different. And I, I would say we remain quite near the beginning of the process of researching and studying the topic a process that I imagine is going to continue for centuries rather than decades. New things come to light routinely. As an example, a recent book, a book just published, uh, I think a week or two ago, uh, by Heather Dune McAdam, examines the first transport of Jews sent to Auschwitz in 1942, which comprised 999 women from Slovakia who had been sold by the Slovakian regime to the Nazis at, a, uh, at the rate of uh, 500 Reichmarks per head in order to be disposed of. And the impact that, that this had on, on me is to bring Slovakia to, to more to the center of, of concerns about the, the Holocaust. And I mention this partly because Slovakia is very much the focus of our discussion this evening. So to, to start us off, Tommy, um, there will be people in the audience who haven't had the opportunity as yet to read your great book. Uh, so would you start us off by outlining your personal story in order to give us the context and setting for the rest of our discussion? Uh, thank you. Thank you also for everybody that is here. You are very welcome. And Ray, thank you for inviting me and uh, presented me uh, your uh, introduction about me. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know if uh, most of you probably saw me on television or in some uh, way that uh, I'm speaking all around Ireland about the uh, Holocaust, but I just uh, shortly, uh, in a short, I introduce myself. My name is Tommy Reichenthal. I'm living in Ireland for the past 60 years. Uh, I'm uh, Jewish and I'm a Holocaust survivor. Uh, it, it's, for me, it's very important, of course, uh, to speak about the Holocaust uh, because I lost uh, so many members of my family. And therefore, I 
take uh, every opportunity uh, that I can, uh, not for my own uh, benefit, but for the uh, uh, knowledge that people should know uh, what the Holocaust was about. When I started to speak about the Holocaust, and I would ask somebody what you know about the Holocaust, basically people shook their head a little bit and then said, uh, well, six million Jews uh, perished and uh, uh, were murdered. And that was basically uh, what uh, the student, the uh, young people would know. And that was one of the reasons uh, that I uh, sort of uh, come into this uh, uh, conversation uh, to speak, uh, uh, especially to young people, but I uh, speak to uh, private events, uh, historical society, of course, and uh, all kind of uh, 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 events that uh, people do, and uh, I'm invited to speak about the Holocaust as well. Of course, the Holocaust is not only about uh, six million Jews that perish, and that sometimes I find it a little um, strange that that's the main point uh, when we speak about the Holocaust. Uh, Holocaust is also about racism, about education, about persecution, uh, about uh, 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 Jewish people were uh, expelled from their own society where they lived. For example, my family lived in uh, Czechoslovakia at the time, and now it is Slovakia, uh, for hundreds of years in uh, Slovakia. Before, when I did research about my uh, family tree, I discovered already in the uh, beginning of uh, the 1700s, we lived actually in Slovakia. And uh, one day we were just expelled from the society. Uh, we were Jewish uh, and therefore we didn't belong uh, to the Slovak society. Anything that was going wrong in Slovakia, uh, the, the propaganda, the propaganda uh, pointed the finger on the Jews of Slovakia. It's their fault. And unfortunately, today, when only about 300 Jews live in Slovakia, the, the anti-Semite, when there is any problem, they're again blaming the Jews for, it's the fault of the Jews. And uh, well, before the war, there were about um, 85 to 90,000 Jews in Slovakia. Today, there are only 300. And again, the anti-Semite uh, uh, pointing uh, at, at the Jews that uh, uh, what is going wrong, it's uh, a Jewish uh, people reason. And the people that are living there today, they're all old people. Uh, they have nothing to do with anything. And still, uh, unfortunately, the anti-Semite uh, uh, do play the Jews. But it's happening. But of course, all this uh, didn't start uh, didn't start from nothing. Um, uh, the the anti-Semitism is not uh, some new invention. Uh, but the sad thing is that uh, today anti-Semitism is again on the rise, and of course, uh, um, racism as well. Well, for this reason, it's very important to remind people uh, what uh, anti-Semitism and racism mean. And um, when we look around um, the persecution that is happening uh, today, not necessarily uh, 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 Jews, but we have the refugee problem. And therefore, uh, for me, when I'm looking at it, uh, it's a repeat of the history. Uh, because uh, uh, you know, the, in the late uh, 30s, when the Jewish people wanted to escape Europe from persecution, and of course uh, they saw the writing on the, ro on the wall, they wanted to escape Europe, nobody wanted them. And today we have the same thing, that uh, uh, 
uh, people that are being persecuted in various uh, uh, countries in Africa, Middle East, uh, and they're looking for a safe haven just to live in peace. Uh, nobody wants them either. So that's why today the, the Holocaust uh, subject is more important than ever. And, and uh, the sad thing is, of course, that the Holocaust is uh, slowly being uh, forgotten. Uh, when uh, people doing research today, uh, I just recently uh, read about uh, uh, what uh, uh, people, how much they are aware of Holocaust. Uh, for example, in America, uh, in Europe, there were around uh, 40,000 uh, uh, concentration camps and uh, ghettos. And when they asking the millennials in America what you know about the Holocaust, they 42 percent, 42 percent, just incredible number, don't are uh, are unable to mention even one uh, place where Holocaust uh, uh, took place, and uh, various other. Uh, question of, of uh, uh, what happened during the Holocaust, uh, about uh, what Auschwitz was. People uh, don't know in America, Canada, in Europe, it's also going down the number, for example, uh, in France uh, uh, and some of the Eastern country. Uh, they believe that less than uh, 2 million uh, Jews, 22% believe less than 2 million uh, Jews were uh, killed in the Holocaust. Uh, so as the time is going on, Holocaust is uh, sort of falling behind. And that's again one of the important reasons that I speak about the Holocaust. I just want to mention a little bit um, uh, what I went through, and uh, Ben will then give me uh, other question, a connection of my life during the Holocaust and my opinions about it. Well, I was arrested uh, with uh, several members of the, first of all, we were uh, betrayed uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Slovak uh, uh, authorities, and uh, we were arrested uh, on the 16th of um, uh, uh, August, 16th of October, uh, 1944. Uh, now, in Slovakia, there were really two phases uh, of uh, uh, deportation in Jews. The deportation of Jews began uh, in March 1942. But at the time, only people that were not useful to the economy were being arrested. In other words, small shopkeepers, uh, government employees, uh, men that they were discharged from the army, uh, and uh, 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 people basically that were not useful to the economy. Because my father was a farmer, we lived in a small village, we got a, a document that exempted us in this first uh, uh, deportation that we shouldn't be uh, taken away. And during this first deportation out of a population of uh, uh, 85, 90,000 Jews that live in Slovakia, uh, 58,000 were deported. And according to the statistic, out of the 58,000, only between uh, 280 and 500 survive. The rest of them uh, all uh, were murdered in the Holocaust. Among them, there were about 30 uh, members of my uh, family. At the time, uh, when we said goodbye to them, we didn't even cry. We, we just said, look, when all this is over, we will be reunited and everything would be all right. We didn't know what was happening at the time. But unfortunately, uh, that was for the last time 
that we saw them. In fact, the Slovak Jewry uh, was the first uh, Jews that were being gassed in the gas chamber. Uh, unfortunately, Slovakia was a fascist, uh, had a fascist regime. Slovakia was very friendly uh, to, to the Nazi regime in Germany, and therefore Slovakia was even not occupied uh, by Germany, while the rest of Europe was being occupied, like France, Belgium, Holland. Slovakia uh, cooperated with the German. Uh, there was great uh, uh, cooperation in in helping with the war effort when the war started in 1939. Slovakia provided the uh, transport for the manpower and uh, equipment, ammunition, uh, heavy equipment like tank and guns uh, to be uh, transported through Slovakia to the uh, Polish border where, of course, the war began. There were also over 100,000 uh, uh, volunteers from Slovakia that worked in Germany in the ammunition factories and, and engineering uh, concern where they um, helped with the war effort. These people sent money home, which helped Slovak economy and also the cooperation that Slovakia had uh, transporting the equipment, the German paid for it, and that's how um, it was helpful uh, to the Slovak economy. But of course, the fascist regime was uh, anti-Jewish, and as I mentioned, uh, their propaganda was uh, that uh, everything that went wrong in Slovakia was a uh, fault of the Jews. If the harvest wasn't good, they blamed the Jews for it. So that's how the hatred against the Jews uh, built up. Didn't take long time before laws were introduced in Slovakia. There were the uh, Jew Jewish uh, Codex, it was wo called. It has 270 paragraphs exempting the Jews from the uh, society, we were not allowed to uh, go to public places, we were not allowed to go to national school. Uh, basically, uh, uh, we were uh, expelled uh, from the society. So the life for the Jewish people uh, began to change very drastically from uh, 39 when the German invaded the Czech Republic and annexed Sudetenland. They also imposed the uh, fascist uh, government in uh, Slovakia. And from then on, uh, the persecution of Jews began. I, of course, didn't know anything about it uh, for the simple reason that my parents didn't tell me anything about it uh, because they didn't want it to frighten me. I only realized when I went to school. I couldn't go to the school in the village. I was expelled because it was national school. So I was sent, sent to the neighboring town, uh, which was called Nitra. And uh, I had to wear the yellow star. Uh, and when my aunt uh, uh, saw the yellow star on my coat, and I asked, what is that, that for? Because in the village, I didn't wear it. Uh, uh, everybody knew us anywhere, and there was no police to uh, uh, impose the law. Uh, so when I asked, she said, no, it's nothing. We are Jewish, and we have to wear the yellow star. I didn't even ask, didn't even ask why or what. And uh, only then uh, I realized when I went to school, I went to school with my aunt. The school wasn't very far, and after two or three days, uh, she said, uh, you can go on your own. And when I saw the uh, children standing on the corner of the street uh, without the yellow star, of course, they were gentle. Suddenly, they started to shout at me, uh, you dirty you, you smelly you, go to Palestine, and all kind of insult. I, I didn't know why they're attacking me. I never harmed anybody. 
I uh, never did uh, anything wrong. Uh, but that was the first time uh, that I realized that uh, I'm different uh, than the other children. Uh, and it was in uh, 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 late 1941, for the first time, that I knew that something is going on. But at that time, already, uh, the deportation began. Uh, uh, the arrest of Jews began, and of course uh, the first uh, arrest were uh, young Jewish uh, women and Jewish men, and therefore, as Ben mentioned, the first transport of 2,000 girls was in March 1942, uh, uh, straight to Auschwitz, many of them uh, the, um, uh, were murdered, but many were left to uh, welcome uh, the, the transport that, of course, at the time began. It went unabated uh, up to October. In October, the deportation uh, stopped. There were a couple of reasons why it stopped. Uh, one was that uh, the Jewish leadership began to bribe the uh, people that were responsible for the deportation, because I, I have to mention again, uh, Slovakia was not occupied uh, by Germany. Uh, Slovakia actually uh, was uh, one of the only countries that paid the Germans to pay, uh, take the Jews away. And the condition was uh, that uh, when they pay for them and they are taken away, they must never come back. And uh, at the time, uh, I remember the propaganda was that the Jews are being taken away, they are working, and uh, uh, the, the films that were shown uh, where uh, people are uh, making their laundry, uh, playing uh, all kind of sport, uh, eating in line, nice uh, eatery, like places, sort of uh, restaurant. And of course, it was all lies, unfortunately. Slowly, the uh, news were filtering uh, what was really uh, happening in this concentration time camps. So the Jewish people uh, began to be very afraid and uh, uh, were hiding uh, uh, they in all kinds of uh, families uh, that they would pay them and they would hide them for a while, and when the money ran out, they said, you, you have to leave, and uh, unfortunately, they also ended up in, in concentration camp. But uh, the Slovak people also uh, suffered uh, during this uh, Nazi dita dictatorial regime. So in August 1944, there was a rebellion against the uh, Slovak government and because a lot of the soldiers and police uh, joined the rebellion, Germany occupied uh, Slovakia, not because they wanted to occupy Slovakia, but because they wanted to save the sympathetic uh, Slovak regime. Uh, within a very short period, uh, the rebellion was suppressed. Uh, thousands of uh, young Slovak uh, uh, died in this battle. It is estimated about 15,000 lost their life uh, during the uprising. Uh, it was suppressed. Uh, the resistance uh, continued, but uh, unfortunately, with the German army also unit of Adolf Eichmann arrived to Slovakia. Adolf Eichmann, you might have heard about him. He was the man organizing uh, the transport into this uh, uh, extermination camp. And of course, immediately, uh, the Gestapo joined the Slovak police. They became very efficient. They put spies all over the place uh, to and get the reminding uh, uh, 25,000 Jews that were still left in Slovakia. 
and uh, during this time uh, we were trying to hide and uh, it was sort of a period that uh, because of the uh, Slovak people suffered under this uh, uh, fascist regime, uh, many of them were helping us a little bit. So when the police was in the neighboring village looking for Jews, they would inform us that uh, the police is on the way and we would run to the cornfield and we would hide there. Uh, when they come to our village looking for us, uh, the house was locked and uh, probably uh, they uh, reported to the superior that we were not home. And this, this was happening many times, but eventually, fortunately, uh, it was 16 of October uh, that uh, we were uh, betrayed and uh, arrested. Uh, my father was arrested separately uh, before us because we moved uh, from our village uh, to Bratislava, and from there we were going to a, a new place, pretending that we were Gentiles. We had false paper, which were provided by a Roman Catholic priest uh, from the village to us. Uh, he really, uh, it was a great courage of him uh, to do this, because if he was found out at the time uh, that he gave us false paper, he also taught us, my brother and myself, uh, uh, a little about the Roman Catholic religion because uh, when we were going to the uh, different uh, village, of course, we would have to go uh, to the school and if we didn't know anything about the Roman Catholic religion, uh, they would have known very quickly uh, that we were uh, Jews. So uh, we were, uh, uh, what he did, it was very, heroic and uh, I actually, uh, well, after the war, 40 years later, I visited the village for the first time and I went to his graveyard thanking him uh, for his uh, effort to try to uh, save us. Uh, uh, because at the time, if he was found out, he wouldn't have put, been put on trial. He would have been put to the wall and they would have shot him. So it was very heroic thing of him to do. But uh, as I said, we were, uh, despite the fact that we had a false paper, we were betrayed and we ended up in uh, Bergen-Belsen uh, concentration camp. Bergen-Belsen was not extermination camp, uh, but uh, people were uh, dying uh, in Belgian Belsen due to the uh, disease, which was mainly typhoid, uh, but also due to uh, starvation uh, and cold. Uh, the condition in Belgian Belsen were uh, terrible. Uh, our day started with a uh, roll call, which would last well over an hour. We had to stand outside in freezing cold uh, for, till our supervisor came. The temperature used to drop in uh, Belgian Belsen. It's a, uh, Belgian Belsen is situated in northern Germany. Uh, it actually uh, was built in 1939 uh, to hold uh, uh, prisoners of war. Uh, French and Belgian from the beginning and then later on uh, uh, Russian and Polish uh, uh, prisoners. It is estimated that at the time about 20,000 soldiers died building uh, uh, the camp because they built it in the uh, middle of winter and uh, they had no roof over the uh, head and due to starvation and disease, and of course, due to the cold, many uh, froze to death. So it's estimated about 20,000 died. But in 1943, the German authority decided uh, to convert the camp uh, to hold that only mainly uh, Jewish, but they were Jehovah Witnesses, they were gypsies, uh, political prisoners, gay and lesbian. Uh, they 
Kampf was divided in about uh, six parts. Uh, when we arrived uh, to Bergen-Belsen, which was on the 9th of uh, November 1944, what we saw uh, the only way I can describe it was hell on earth. We, we saw a skeleton walking around, uh, uh, shaved head. We didn't know if they were women or men. Uh, we only later on uh, discovered that uh, uh, the hospital was uh, not far from us. Uh, if I say hospital, you might think uh, people were cured there. Uh, but uh, in the uh, Belgian Belgian, uh, they didn't cure anybody. They basically come there uh, to, to die. So the people, the skeleton we saw, uh, were uh, mortally sick. Uh, they had shaved hand, uh, head. Uh, they have the stripe uh, uh, uniform. We didn't even know if they were men of women, because you couldn't see any attributes. They were just skeleton walking. Uh, in several days, we discovered that we were in uh, a woman camp. And uh, so these uh, skeleton that were walking aimlessly around, sometimes they fell on the ground, uh, never to come uh, get up again. As children, we learn as we were playing outside, that uh, when the woman fell down, if she got up, we knew she had another day to live. But most of them, they didn't get up. And uh, we actually were looking people dying in uh, front of our eyes. But um, as I said, it wasn't an extermination camp, Bergen Belsen, but people were uh, dying from the, uh, uh, the, the a cruel life uh, that we lived there. Uh, we were supervised by SS women. Uh, they were worse than a man uh, for anything, the slightest uh, thing. If you stepped out uh, of the line, uh, you were beaten up. You had to uh, be very disciplined. If you uh, didn't keep your place, uh, According to the rule, you would be beaten up. I saw daily beating of uh, uh, inmate, uh, which as I was at the time only 99 year old. Uh, the, the, we didn't understand. Uh, we didn't comprehend uh, that all this what we seeing around was com uh, it, it was a crime against humanity. So as children, we really didn't grasp uh, the, uh, the, the, the crime uh, that was being committed. So I must say, I, I survived the, uh, the uh, uh, camp, the Holocaust, very well. I didn't uh, suffer after the war with nightmare and having bad dream or anything like this, whereas the uh, adult, they, they suffer much more because they understood what, what was happening and many were affected for, for, the, for life. And, and still today we have institution where Holocaust survivors uh, are uh, uh, living because they can't face the uh, outside world. So it's 75 lead, uh, Years later, there is still uh, uh, their suffering. Uh, we were starving, uh, and, and starvation is it's a, a terrible thing because uh, first you are hungry, uh, and then you begin to starve. And when you're starving, uh, the body eats itself from inside, and uh, finally you become like skeleton, and eventually you die. Uh, the food that we ate per day was not sufficient to sustain you alive. Our uh, uh, intake of food, when we uh, want to uh, uh, translate it into uh, a scientific way, 
a, a normal person, adult person, would eat about 2,500 uh, calories a day. Anybody that uh, uh, works at hard work or uh, in a, a, a sports people that have to train and uh, be able to do, do the sport they do, they even eat 3,500 calories. Our intake of calories was a little over 600 calories. That's not sufficient to sustain your life. And therefore, when you're seeing this uh, uh, film, uh, uh, archive film, and you will see a lot of them now because of the 75 years uh, commemoration since the uh, end of the war, uh, you see all the inmates in concentration camp, they are skeleton uh, because they were all starving. And eventually, uh, they died, and many of them, uh, they couldn't bear this uh, uh, time of starving because the, when you're starving, you don't die overnight. It takes weeks and months, and they couldn't bear it. They would run towards the barbed wire and, uh, in the night, and of course, the guards in the watchtower, they would see them. They would shoot them. They didn't want to escape. They couldn't escape. They just wanted to escape the torture that they were suffering. And we used to hear these uh, shots being fired during the night, and in the morning, we would see the corpses lying over the barbed wire. So the life in Belgian Belsen was very cruel. Uh, but um, eventually, uh, the uh, German army was losing the war. They were retreating. And as they were retreating, they were taking the uh, prisoner with them. And so many come to Belgian Belsen. Belgian Belsen was built for about 25,000 uh, uh, prisoners or, or yeah, detainees. Uh, but um, uh, when uh, these prisoners come from Auschwitz is estimated over 30,000 come to Belgian Belsen. There was no room for them. Uh, there was no food, so we got less food. And the huts that were built for 150, 200 uh, people suddenly contained 600, 700 uh, people. So it was at uh, this time that the tragedy of Belgian Belsen happened because in this congestion, in these uh, huts, epidemic of typhoid broke uh, out and people began to die in the hundred. It is estimated that between uh, uh, in February, March and April of 1945, per day, over 500 inmates were dying in Belgian Belsen. We had a crematoria in Belgian Belsen where the corpses were being burned uh, in the normal time when every day, as I mentioned, people were dying from starvation, cold, and disease. Uh, they might have uh, every day died 60, 80, 100. And there was a crematoria where these corpses were being burned. This crematoria went 24 hours a day uh, from the day we arrived uh, till uh, days before the liberation. Uh, but of course, when so many people began to die, uh, the crematoria could not cope with these corpses, so the corpses were thrown outside. And we began to see that these piles of corpses uh, were being uh, all over the a camp. I remember as children also where we had a little green area to play, suddenly we have uh, piles of corpses and we played among these uh, corpses. Uh, we played hide and seek, we chased each other. So you can imagine uh, the scene. These corpses were uh, uh, decomposing and rotting away. The stench became on Berry, when the British Army, before they entered the uh, camp, uh, they uh, said that they were about two miles outside of the camp. The stench was unbearable. We lived in 
middle of it. Uh, so the, the conditions were horrific, and that's when the tragedy of Belgian Belsen happened, even though Belgian Belsen was not an uh, extermination camp in Belgian Belsen. During the existence of Belgian Belsen, it is estimated uh, that up to 70,000 uh, people died. First, the 20,000 soldiers and uh, during the uh, incarceration of the Jews and the other people uh, is estimated around uh, uh, 52,000. Uh, we knew at that time that uh, liberation is uh, near, unfortunately. We suffered as well a tragedy. Uh, I lost uh, my grandmother. Uh, she was with us in the camp, and it was on the 7th of March, uh, 1945, in the morning when I b woke up. I saw my mother and aunt, they were crying, and I said, why are you crying? What happened? And they told me that my grandmother uh, passed away. I will never forget this uh, morning, and I carry this memory uh, still today with me, and I will carry it uh, to the end, my, the end of my life. I remember these uh, uh, two on the command, or the special command, or we call them, uh, that uh, gathered all these corpses, come to the room, we had to strip my grandmother. She was like a little baby, the skin was just hung from her, she was just a little skeleton. And one picked her up by the hand, one by leg, they threw her on the cart, which was a cart with two wheels. Then she was wheeled out and thrown on the uh, piles of corpses outside. Uh, it, it's something that for a child uh, is just uh, unbelievable. She, she used to uh, read stories to me. She used to do the uh, loveliest uh, cakes for me when I was a kid living in Slovakia. And uh, that's how she was buried. And uh, uh, of course, we never saw her again. Uh, we have a little plaque that we uh, put in Belgian Belsen uh, for her, so uh, I will be going just uh, shortly to Belgian Belsen uh, for making a film for the, uh, at the time when we will be commemorating the liberation of Belgian Belsen. Belgian Belsen was liberated on the 15th of April in 1945, so uh, this year will be 75 years. I remember very well uh, the liberation, how it happened. It happened suddenly. We were expecting it because the people that come from Auschwitz told us that uh, the German army is retreating. Uh, but we still have had to wait uh, two and a half uh, months of torture and suffering. Uh, at the time, I only remember uh, it wasn't a cheerful uh, welcome uh, because 90% of the inmates were mortally sick. I remember just that uh, uh, some of the women were throwing uh, little branches of trees uh, towards the army as a welcoming sign. Belgian Belsen was middle of a, a forest, so they broke some branches and they were throwing. But there was no uh, jumping and uh, laughing and thing. It was very subdued because um, people were mortally sick, and in fact, uh, it is estimated that about 14,000 died after the liberation because uh, they were just uh, too far uh, gone. And, uh, of course, from uh, the, the, uh, the uh, article that were written at the time, the medical team that came to help uh, because when the British army arrived, they were so overwhelmed. Uh, they didn't know how to cope with the situation there. Uh, when the medical teams arrived, they actually had, uh, had to make choices who to look after, because they were told if you see somebody that you can't save anymore, don't look after them. Look after the people that you can um, uh, help them. 
So you can imagine they had this responsibility to actually choose between inmates who to look after and who not because they were so overwhelmed. I remember as a child, uh, these soldiers when they come in, and they were young men, they were uh, 20, 23, three year old, crying because they couldn't believe what they uh, uh, found there. And there is a, a famous uh, 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 clip in the film that the British Army made, and uh, this surgeon is saying, now I know why I was fighting in this war, and if I had to do it again, I would do it again, because it, this, uh, what, what they discover, what they find out. So, uh, of course, there is a lot more to say, uh, what happened afterwards, but uh, I think Ben will uh, uh, tweet it out of me, and uh, we were liberated on the uh, 15th of April, and uh, maybe with Ben we will okay. uh, continue uh, uh, the effect and uh, whatever he has to ask me. I have some of the uh, questions sure. that I, I'm going to get. Okay. So, uh, well. <laughs> In, in the book, you write that for many years uh, you, you didn't speak at all about these experiences during the Holocaust, although your family was aware that you are a survivor. Yeah. Can you tell us something about how and why you came to feel that you could and should and maybe wanted to explore these terrible episodes in detail and to share them not just with your family, but with strangers like us. Yeah. How did that come about? Yeah, no, of course, after the war, when we were liberated, we went back to, to Slovakia. Uh, and uh, it, it is not something uh, special, but most of the Holocaust survivor didn't speak about it. They didn't speak about it because it was so ho horrific that we wanted to forget about it. Of course, we never will. No, nobody could forget about it. It was so horrific. And uh, I only remember when my uh, kids uh, went on holiday to, to Disneyland, to America, and they come back, and my grandchildren as well, they were just keen to tell me what they experienced, how they went on these various uh, uh, enjoying uh, uh, event that they uh, have in these places. But when I come home, I didn't tell my father nothing. I just come home like I come from somewhere nowhere. I imagined because we were, uh, my, my, we were with my mother and my aunt, I have one cousin with my brother, uh, we, we were there and uh, I suppose my mother uh, must have told my father because we were reunited, thankfully, after the war, uh, where we were and what happened. And therefore, my father didn't ask me, well, what, what did you do and all this? So I stopped speaking about it. Then I started to go to school and conducted my life like nothing happened. And I didn't speak about my experiences for 60 years. I never spoke to anybody. I retired because I said uh, I have no, no more responsibility. Uh, I had my business and uh, I don't need to work anymore. But of course, uh, I was always a very active person. Uh, and I began, for the first time, write some article uh, to a, a magazine. And, um, for the first time about my experiences. So, of course, immediately the uh, media came up to me and they wanted to know more and more. And also in uh, 2002, the Holocaust Education uh, Trust uh, started here in Ireland. But they didn't know that I was a Holocaust survivor. But once they uh, saw it uh, in the newspapers and 
television once they saw me, uh, they approached me to speak about it. And uh, I, I, I remember at the time, uh, on the first uh, Holocaust commemoration that I went to, was I think in 2004, and um, they wanted me to speak a little bit about my experiences. I said, I can't, but I will light a, uh, light a candle. And uh, I told that my son uh, should uh, read one of my stories, and that's what happened at the time. But at the time, I also realized that there, it was so little known uh, that young people didn't know uh, what really happened uh, uh, during the Holocaust. As I mentioned before, when I asked some student, they told me uh, that six million Jews were murdered. That's basically what they knew, because what was uh, uh, what they learned in the historic um, uh, classes was basically uh, about the Second World War and uh, what was devoted was maybe an hour uh, for Holocaust education at the time. Today, there is, of course, much more because of the uh, Holocaust, uh, uh, Holocaust um, Education Trust that uh, sends a lot of uh, uh, material to the school. And of course, I'm speaking uh, all over Ireland. I visited over uh, 600 schools only in Ireland, but I also travel and I uh, speak outside Ireland as well. So uh, at the time, uh, they were asking me, uh, and I realized that I'm one of the last uh, witnesses to this horrific event. And it was sort of a decision that I have to speak in order to inform the young people uh, about the Holocaust. But not only that, I also realized that I owe it to the victims that their memory is not forgotten. And that, so it was a very slow process uh, that I started uh, little by little uh, speaking about the Holocaust until it uh, got really out of hand. And I was booked uh, two years uh, in advance uh, to speak every week. And uh, now I'm speaking again uh, quite a lot all over the place. And I sometimes mention, you know, for 60 years I didn't speak my, about the Holocaust, but today nobody can stop me. Because for me, it's very, very important that we don't forget. Because only by remembering the history, we can stop the history repeat itself. And the one uh, proverb, that, uh, or proverb or thing that uh, I, I uh, always mention, Holocaust did not start with gas chamber. Holocaust started with whisper, town, dubbing, abuse, and the last step was the murder. And it is up to us all to make sure that we stop this uh, happen again if we stop it at the whispering uh, stage. And this is the stage of today, and that's why it's so important for me to speak about it. Okay. I think it, it might just be useful for the audience to, to know not, not all survivors had this long period of, of silence and some very important uh, collections of testimony were formed even before the end of the 1940s and then again in the 1950s. So there was quite a few books were written and memoirs were written, studies were written, so, but not quite on the scale that, that really began, I think, in the 1980s. It then, it then took off quite sharply. Now, your, your book is based, of course, primarily on your, on your memories uh, and on the stories of your loved ones and friends. But there is a great deal more in the book than can have come from the, the memory of, of a young boy. So I'm curious to, to know how you went about writing it, 
what sort of research you did, and what maybe maybe you could try to describe you know, a typical day while you were writing this book. What how what was the process that you, yeah. you went through? Well, I of of course what I wrote was uh, my biography. Yeah, and uh, that was the basic thing. But I to begin the book. I'm talking about the situation Slovakia before the deportation started, the mm. political. So, of course, I did a lot of research, yeah. reading uh, books, and I had uh, uh, one very important book. This was a lady that I knew very well. Mm. She uh, 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 studied uh, in university in Slovakia, right. and she the project was the Holocaust, mm. uh, how it happened in Slovakia. So that was... Uh, very important. But also during the writing, when I was writing the book, because my cousin and my brother were with me, uh, I, I got a lot of help mm. from them. My brother is uh, uh, three and a half year older than me. I was nine year old, he was nearly 13 year old mm. at the time. And my cousin, uh, she was a very intelligent lady, uh, she was a principal in a school, and the, her memory was very good. Mm -hmm. So any instances that you read in the book, the, uh, and I write them in uh, quite details, mm -hmm. uh, I always consulted uh, with my brother and my cousin. And um, this is 60 years later, and I'm well, writing precisely. the book. So uh, it was very interesting that any of these events, we all remembered, mm -hmm. but we remembered it differently. Okay. And there were different uh, things that I was writing about. And I, I, I brought some story where I said that this uh, SS woman uh, came into the room. And my brother would say, no, it wasn't a woman, it was a man. So there was sort of a thing I said to my cousin, what you remember, was a woman or a man? And she said, no, that was a woman. So I wrote so you it. went with that. <laughs> I went, the majority was with that. <laughs> a um, democratic book. Uh, you wrote quite a few books, so you know how it is with a, a publisher. I remember when... Uh, well, did you travel at all? While you were, did you travel at all? Did you go at back the time to... Of, no, at the time of writing, no. I did not. And... Um, and uh, it, the publisher, I, many people ask me that I should write a book. And I said, uh, no, I, I, unless somebody comes to me and um, wants me to write a book, I will do it. But not, I'm not, not a writer. I'm not a, uh, um, yeah, I don't write book. <coughs> I did uh, a, a film. Before I wrote the book, uh, it was also about my life. It was uh, called uh, Till the Ten Generation. And um, after the film was shown, it was shown here in Ireland, I think it was in 2007 or 2008. Um, uh, it was shown in, uh, on, the, uh, on the television and in the cinemas. Uh, a publisher came to me and said, uh, I would like you to write a book and thing. And you would know how it goes. The publisher comes with a contract to you, sign the contract, and you have to finish the book in, in and you're under pressure. October. Yeah. And every three months you have to supply. Some, and I, I said, uh, Michael O'Brien was the publisher, the Irish publisher. Uh, and that basically why they do it, because they want to secure that they get the book. Because when you write a book and then suddenly you be begin to be very mean, you, you think to yourself, ah, Michael, it's, it's a small little publisher. Why shouldn't I give it to Penguin or somebody? They will be more interesting. I will make more money, you know. But I said, I, I said to Michael, I said, 
Michael, here is the contract it was of a pile like this. They promised me money and all this. I said, you can take it away, but I promise you, I won't go to anybody else. And when I finish the uh, book, you have the rights to the book. Uh, and I was very busy with my lectures and traveling all over the place. Uh, so uh, writing it, it wasn't. It was two years mm -hmm. um, uh, for me to write a book, and uh, writing a biography is also, I think, different than writing some uh, research about yeah. a different thing. When you're writing a biography, you you brain begin to work from day to day. So while you're writing it, many things you begin to remember. Mm -hmm. You might not remember it uh, it's, exactly, it's like a, it's like but that was the reason I always used to contact my uh, brother and my cousin mm -hmm. and we sort of uh, uh, consulted to get the true story. So the book is very truthful. And the biggest compliment I got was when I sent the book to Belgian Belsen, and I sent it to the man in Belgian Belsen. His name was Dr. Rahe, who was responsible uh, to describe the life of the children of Belgian Belsen. And I sent the book to him, and he wrote to me back afterwards, and he said, I hope the Irish and the British will appreciate the authenticity of the book because it's so exact what happened at the time. So the book is very truthful. I didn't exaggerate. There are things there which are horrific that I described, and uh, I remember them, and they did happen. I can't even speak about them. So that's why I called my book, It's for Adults, It's Not for Children. I uh, cooperated with another author, uh, Edna Massey. I, and we wrote a book called Tommy, uh, which is for uh, uh, children. I have a couple of them <coughs> here, so if somebody wants them. And um, uh, they're for children from sort of nine, ten years upward, uh, just to introduce them uh, to the Holocaust. I didn't put all these horrific things in, so it's very successful as well. Now, we're, we're having this conversation here at the university as our way of marking Holocaust Memorial Day and to remember and I hope to recommit ourselves to the idea that these monstrous events should not be part of anybody else's future. And yet, the world around us is darkening at a frightening pace. Do you believe that we're capable of genuinely learning from the Holocaust to relate to the other uh, in, with less hostility and hatred? And what difference, in your mind, has a generation of Holocaust commemoration and education made to that process? Well, it, it's, a, it, it's a very important question today. And of course, we have to remember uh, that after the Holocaust, uh, this slogan was born never again. I'm sure you heard about it many times. And uh, can we really say today, did, did that uh, uh, promise uh, uh, held? Did it held? And if we uh, think about what happened since uh, Holocaust in Darfur, in the Rwanda, in Bosnia, uh, just recently with the Rohingyas from Malaysia, uh, and, and Darfur, uh, all these events uh, were um, genocide. Uh, but I will concentrate really more to the thing that happened in Srebrenica, in, in, uh, in uh, Yugoslavia, Croatia, where uh, there was a, whole, uh, a genocide uh, that didn't happen in 1945. It happened in 1995, only 25 years ago, uh, where uh, 8,300 boys and men uh, were uh, killed in cold blood. And these were not uh, men that held weapons in, in, in hand or were fighting. 
they were killed only because they were Muslim. Uh, and that happened in 1995, not 1945. So you question, uh, could it happen again? It, it, it could. And it's a very dangerous time today uh, when we see that the racism and anti-Semitism all over Europe and may, uh, uh, more in Eastern Europe and in, even in America uh, is on the rise. And therefore, uh, if we're talking about usefulness of uh, 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 commemorating the uh, Holocaust, it's very, very important. We have to learn from the uh, past, from the history. Uh, because if we don't learn, uh, it will happen again. And uh, you, you must remember, only a couple of months ago, here in Ireland, I mean, I'm living here 60 years, for the first time, uh, the debate about racism, bullying, and uh, uh, statement from leaders in our society, uh, demonstration against uh, 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 refugees here in some of the uh, villages, and uh, statement from, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, from uh, leaders of our society, and then uh, saying something against the travelers, which we have problem here and then just apologizing, uh, thinking that, that that's enough, but because of the politics, uh, these people stayed in the post. Uh, but we must remember when they said it, uh, they meant it. And it's not enough just to apologize. There should be consequences. That's what we have to make sure, that the people have to know they did wrong. It's not just to apologize and yeah, everything is all right. Uh, we had a couple that was on the late late, that, uh, if you remember, uh, the girl was an uh, uh, Irish girl, uh, the boy was uh, uh, a foreigner, and they got such abuse that they had to uh, leave uh, uh, to England for a couple of weeks uh, because of the, uh, the threats that they received. So uh, that's the reason why for me, speaking about it and warning uh, people about uh, what can happen if somebody somewhere with uh, their ideology uh, can uh, start something and uh, it will be too late if we realize uh, that something terrible is, might happen. So it is now and that uh, we have to uh, uh, commemorate and remind the people more and more uh, that people know more about the history uh, so it's not repeated again. Mm. Okay. And then I think, it, I think we must touch on, on the issue of Holocaust denial and, and uh, relativization, not least because of the way that relates to uh, debate about the state of Israel. Denial is, is a central fact and aspect of, of every genocide, and I'd go so far to say that if it isn't being denied, it's not a genocide. But in, in the case of the Holocaust, it has a critical contemporary uh, importance because the purpose of, of denying the Holocaust is to undermine the legitimacy of Israel as the national home of the Jewish people. And so as, as a survivor of the Holocaust, but also as someone who, who has lived in the state of Israel, what, what are your feelings about this? Well, of, of course, I would have little problem with this uh, uh, question. I, I lived in Israel. I would be biased about uh, uh, Israel, what is happening. Uh, it, it is a, a, a big problem uh, for me as well, uh, especially when I'm talking about refugees and everything like that. Um, and. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that the Jewish people uh, had to have a homeland. 
uh, where to go. Uh, when we take Israel now, uh, what is happening there, uh, the unfortunate thing is, uh, it was right that Israel was established, but at the same time, there were people uh, that were displaced. Uh, uh, I don't want to go to the political uh, thing, whether they were uh, uh, thrown out or whether they went on their own uh, accord because what was happening there, uh, the, it has to be resolved uh, what is uh, happening uh, there uh, politically today and make sure that all the people uh, in Israel can live in uh, peace. Before the Holocaust, uh, uh, in Israel, um, it was called Palestine at the time, Jews lived in the place for thousands of years. So nobody can say that they are stealing uh, the, some uh, area from some other people. It belongs to the people that are there, and it belongs to uh, Jewish people uh, that arrived there because of uh, having a homeland. Jewish people needed a homeland. So that what happened in the late 30s can't happen again. Uh, there is a country uh, for me uh, and other Jewish people like myself and that if God forbid something happen, I have a place where I will be welcomed. And uh, as I said, uh, why it is problematic for me uh, because of the uh, event that happened in the 1948-49 that in order to establish a state of Israel, there were people that um, uh, suffered, and uh, that's problematic for me. And then this, this, this must be our last question. In, in both EU and in UK politics, uh, resurg the resurgence of anti-Semitism has, has made a very big impact. Uh, both, and, and it's anti-Semitism both from the far right and from the left. And I think it's fair to say that, that in, the, in the UK, this issue uh, made a significant impact on the outcome of the, the election in December. Do you have thoughts about why anti-Semitism has come back to haunt us today when, for decades after the war, it was thought that we, we are finished with this? Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I have, specifically as a, a Slovak, whatever happened in Slovakia, uh, of course, it, it, it's something that always uh, bothers me as far as uh, uh, the anti-Semitism is concerned, uh, because, uh, as I said before, we lived there for... Uh, centuries uh, and, and uh, generation and uh, I thought I will live there till end of my life and uh, enjoying this, this was my country. And uh, when we were coming back from uh, the concentration camp, uh, the people were still poisoned with uh, uh, with the propaganda they were going through and everything and they said, oh, Got more of the Jews are coming back that were taken away. And as I mentioned, in Slovakia lived about uh, nearly 90,000 Jews by end of the war, around 17,000 uh, survived. So uh, this anti-Semitism, uh, an these anti-Semites uh, again shouted, oh, more of them coming back uh, that were taken away. But today, for example, in Slovakia, and at the, at the time, of course, they blamed the Jews for everything that was going wrong in Slovakia. Uh, today, we have a party in Slovakia. It's uh, called uh, Slovakia for Slovaks. These people have the same ideology of the late uh, 30s, that uh, 
uh, racist, they don't want any uh, refugees in uh, Slovakia. Uh, they marching uh, uh, with the fist in the air and they shouting Slovakia for Slovaks. The same slogan that they were shouting in, in the late 30s and 40s. And uh, today in Slovakia, there are only about 300 Jews living there. They're all old people, they're all in the 70s, very few young people. And when something is going wrong, these anti-Semites, they say it's all fault of the Jews. I mean, there are only 30 people in a population of, uh, of uh, I don't know, 20 million or something. You know, how, how can, and why? You ask me why, I have no, no answer. No answer. It's, it just, there is no answer uh, to this. But if I'm talking about individual deniers, uh, like David uh, Irving, Irving. Irving or you know, people like that, uh, these are simply uh, anti Semites, they hate Jews from what reason, who knows. And, and uh, unfortunately, uh, it is something that I think very much about, that uh, I have to speak, because when I'm gone and every, uh, uh, the Jewish people that suffer during the Holocaust, the people that are the witnesses to, to what happened, it will be an open uh, uh, discussion for the deniers to say, oh, that's all rubbish. Uh, this is all Jewish propaganda. It's never happened again. But I hope that you, young people like yourself and everybody else, will be able to say, no, it did happen. We actually met somebody that was there. And that's what is important to me. I spoke to well over 100,000 uh, people personally that I uh, met like I'm meeting you. Uh, they go home and they tell to the parents and friends and other people. So if I speak uh, to uh, like 100,000 people, uh, there are many, many more that actually hear my story. And that's why it's so important for me when I'm invited uh, by some media uh, concerned, uh, uh, newspaper, radio, television, I'm very willing to uh, go, so because that's that's the best place uh, uh, to uh, uh, tell my story and make more people aware what happened. By the way, the Friday that is coming now, I will be on the late late, so <laughs> if you <laughs> you will uh, see me. So uh, it, it it's very important that this discussion and everything. Uh, is uh, brought to the large uh, uh, public and that we don't forget. So I hope you will continue to speak for many years to come, uh, but I would say, you know, what many of the things Tommy has talked about, we are entering a phenomenally dangerous era now and in some ways many of, many, many of the societies across Europe are as it were, sleepwalking on the edge of an abyss. And we need to really engage with these problems and, and find a way to, re to resist and to, to, to defend the true record of history. Um, I think our work here is done, as it were. Well, I think we've overrun our time, yeah. and uh, <laughs> I, for one, am getting hungry. So <laughs> we'll, we'll stop there, and thank you very much okay, for, for thank speaking you. I lost, I, I lost some people in Buchenwald, yeah. No, I'm sure you wouldn't recognize them, but it's all, uh, see, awful, <laughs> awful pictures. 
And, and who, who painted this picture? It's uh, 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 Henry Pieck, a, Dutch, a Dutchman, who was in uh, Buchenwald, and he, picked, he uh, painted them in Buchenwald. And uh, after the war, he survived, and uh, he, uh, uh, he painted them again. So. Incredible. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Well, I, I, I even didn't want to give it to you because you'll be, uh, your mind will go back. Well, what, what uh, I want to just uh, add to it, uh, my uncle, uh, Frantisch Reichenthal, he was a very famous painter. Hmm. And after the war, when um, uh, all the news and what happened, he produced something like this. I, have, I, I, I haven't got the original, but I have copies of it. And he produced it in order uh, to raise uh, uh, cash for the mm -hmm. refugees that were returning to Slovakia. And uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> just uh, so many that were sold at the time uh, for quite a price uh, because uh, he was so famous. Today his pictures are in thousands. Uh, so I, it, it's very similar to, to what you have here. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Oh, did you believe in it to me? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank yeah, you very much. Publish it. Yeah, of course. He came to my, I brought him to my school some years back to speak to my students in Nina, where I was a history teacher. But my question to you is this. Um, to what extent do you think the 2,000 years of demonizing of the Jews by Christianity contributed to the Holocaust? I, I Christian anti-Semitism. By <laughs> the long history of Christian anti-Semitism, and did, really how did it contribute to the Holocaust? Yeah, I know. It's, it's, I, I, you know, I, I made a film which is called uh, uh, Till the Ten Generation, and it's end in something similar. Uh, somebody asked me and say, why is the anti-Semitism? There, there are several, uh, of, of course, answer. Uh, when we go to religion, some people uh, talking about the Jews uh, crucified uh, uh, our father and all this type of thing. Uh, that was all right years and years ago because, in fact, uh, Christ was a rabbi, you know. But uh, why it is uh, persisting all the time, God only knows. As I mentioned about uh, that... Uh, Slovakia today, these anti Semites, when something is not right, they're shouting, it's the fault of the Jews. There are no Jews there, but it is the fault of the Jews. But I, I, I like to also add to this um, uh, when we were at uh, uh, selection in Slovakia, there were 13 members of the family that were arrested uh, together. We were arrested together. And I don't know if you know about the selection. It was a very cruel way how the families were split. The um, mother, children, old people would go to the left, the uh, fathers and young men and women to the right. In other words, the people on the right went to uh, slave labor work. They had a, a possibility to survive, but the people that went to the right, they went straight to the gas chamber. And we experienced this uh, selection. And uh, out of 13, seven went to the right, and uh, six of us uh, went to the left. And there were my grandmother, and aunt, and cousin, my mother, my brother, and myself to the left. The people that went to the right went uh, to Sachsenhausen and Buchenwald. One went, one aunt went to Sachsenhausen and, and uh, 
1966 went to Buchenwald. At the time when we were separated, uh, we, we didn't have time to kiss them or say goodbye. My aunt, her husband went to the right, and my aunt to the left. She had no time to even kiss her goodbye. And we waved sort of to each other, said when it's all over, we will be reunited. It was the last time we saw them. Because when they come to Buchenwald, uh, Buchenwald was a slave labor camp. People walked in stone quarry, in freezing cold, uh, very little food, with disease. And uh, uh, five uh, that went to Buchenwald uh, perished. Uh, uh, my aunt in Sachsenhausen, she died. Only one person survived, it was my cousin, he was 15 years old. So it happened in Buchenwald. I was in Buchenwald as well, not during the Holocaust, but afterwards uh, to visit. So uh, thank you very much for this. Yeah, it's invaluable. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm German. Okay. In 1928, my father was born to a single 17-year-old Jewish mother. Oh my God. It was yeah. not good timing. Uh, a couple of years later, her father had divorced his wife and married my grandmother. So she was now married to a Christian. That's how she managed to survive the war. They had not perfected the system because everything went away. So they didn't get around to deport her. My grandfather refused to divorce her. But her parents died in Auschwitz. And now the last year only, documents have turned up that my father, as a teenager, was put into a labor camp just out of Berlin where mixed race people and spouses who refused to divorce their Jewish partners and the like were rounded up and they were lent out to industry to work in companies, to work in building sites for free. And I was completely bowled over and I'm only just starting to look into it, but that's something I had never heard about. And if you look around here, that was an, a an age younger than most students here. Amazing, yeah. Hi, Tommy. Thank you for coming here to speak to us today. I was just wondering, have you managed to keep your Jewish faith through all this, or has that diminished since? It have you managed to keep your Jewish faith? I can say. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I, 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 well, uh, I'm not very religious. I, I keep sort of traditional uh, Jewish uh, 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 holidays. That we still keep them. We light candles on Friday. Uh, I don't go much to um, uh, the synagogue. I go a couple of times a year. Well, First of all, what happened in the Holocaust, once I was growing up, I was asking the, the same question that you mentioned, uh, wh where is the God, you know? Uh, that was the time that the God should have showed itself, you know? And uh, it didn't. And so I lost sort of faith. Uh, but I'm, a, I'm still here, you know, it, so maybe it was somebody there looking after me. And I, I spoke to many religious people, you know, rabbi, uh, the rabbi in Dublin, if I don't go to, to the synagogue, he comes to me, you know. <laughs> and and uh, we sometimes sort of talk about, it. I'm his hero, he always say. But when I, I go to the synagogue, he sees me from the back and he would come to me and shake my hand that I come in, uh, in the thing. It's not a laughing uh, matter, but 
I think if a person is uh, religious and uh, it helps them, I respect this. Uh, I, I'm a member of synagogue and uh, I pay off a lot of money for my seat. It's uh, very expensive because I never use it. But it, <laughs> is, it, is, it is because I say so that the people that they can't afford to have a place in the synagogue, I prefer to pay for it because I can afford it to give the uh, possibility for my core religionists uh, to have a synagogue that they can uh, use more than I do. But of course, it is a problem for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.